All right, folks, it's time to dive into the subject of resizing dies for 300 blackout. I've been planning this video for a very, very long time and just never got around to it because it's a pretty dense subject. And my initial plan here is to have probably two videos. Today's video will kind of be the shorter video to introduce what's going on, test out our concept. And then the next video will be testing a whole bunch of different brass in all three resizing dies that we've got to play with. We've recently had some issues in 300 blackout. I think it goes back about six months. And there are a couple things that happened right around that time. One, I switched brass. I had been using Lake City brass for a very long time and I switched over to Gemtech 300 blackout brass. Also around the same time, I had been using my Forster resizing die a lot, uh, but I don't even remember the circumstances. Somehow I managed to get a case stuck in this guy and I boogered up the decapping pin. So rather than order a new decapping pin and get it back into action immediately, I set it to the side and switched dies and uh, halfway forgot about it. So somewhere along the line, I picked up the RCBS set, their AR series dies, and switched to using this die most of the time. So I'm wondering if this might be the source of some of my issues. I also have a Lee die that came in my Lee set that we used early on, kind of proved that it worked just fine. I had no issues with it at all. And then it got put in the box and I switched to using my Forster most of the time for no particular reason. Well, like I said, we've had general accuracy issues for like six months and it finally led me to replace my barrel. So the eight and a half inch barrel that I had in my SBR upper, I replaced it and put in an eight inch CMMG barrel. I wanted to try out the one in seven twist, wanted to see how, uh, how good that barrel would shoot since it's pretty affordable. And it was also a little bit disappointing with accuracy. So I immediately ordered a 10.3 inch barrel from Ballistic Advantage. And we put that in several videos ago and we've been running with that guy. Now this is a good barrel. This barrel should shoot. And in the last video we showed that it would shoot. It shot some nice groups, but we had feeding issues and a bunch of bullet setback issues. In that last video, it was the 135 grain Sierra Varminer. It has a little funky tip on it and it was uh, it was not feeding well and it, we were having a bunch of bullet setback issues when it rammed into something and whenever it did go to chamber home we were getting cartridges that were stretching. So we were having neck tension issues. Our brass didn't have a hold of that bullet well enough and it was moving around. So that's kind of what led me to finally decide to make this video. I'm having some issues. I don't know if possibly the Gemtech brass for some reason just doesn't result in sufficient neck tension to combat setback or the RCBS die that I started using around the same time is not giving us enough neck tension. You know, it's, it's sizing the neck too large, perhaps. That's my theory. That's what led us to today. Now, we're going to forget all of that. We're going into this with no preconceived notions. So here is the outline of the basic test I want to do. Today, I've got 30 pieces of brass. The first 15 pieces are once fired Lake City brass. I've got this guy colored green with Sharpie. Yeah, I got it. Let's see. I got green, purple, and red. And I'm hoping that is going to help us track the brass and not get any mix-ups. I've also got the, uh, the dyes color coded here as well. So it's going to be very confusing as to which brass was prepped in which die. So that, that's, that's what the color is all about. But that's what these are. This is uh, once fired Lake City brass that I have chopped it off just below the shoulder, cleaned up that, the case mouth where I chopped it off, and then trimmed them all flat. So they're all nice and square, and they're the same length. And playing around a little bit, whenever these guys get formed into 300 blackout, we should just need to maybe trim off a couple thousands, clean up the case mouth again, and we're ready to shoot. So there they are. Those are Lake City cases as ready to form as I can get them. And the primer pockets have been taken care of, military crimps removed, all of that crap. So a lot of the, a lot of the, the hard work as far as forming goes is already done with those. The other 15 I wanna to test today are the Gemtech brass that we've been shooting around here recently. We got a big bag of like 500 of these guys not too long ago, and this is primarily what we've been shooting. The problem, I don't have any pieces of brass left over that have not been either sized or already fired. So these 15 pieces are actually once fired, but they were not fired in the barrel we're about to shoot it in. So these weren't fired in my ballistic advantage barrel. They were fired in either my 16 inch, my eight and a half inch or my eight inch barrel. So while I would like to have Virgin Gemtech 
to test with. I don't, I've got these, they're going to kind of uh, be the ones we'll, we'll test as far as that. So that's kind of the first video. I want to form the Lake City and size the Gemtech. I want to do five in each of our three dies. For one, go see if they'll shoot a group and make sure that we're, we're not having any bullet setback or stretching issues and that, uh, you know, the natural neck tension of the case is enough to hold on to the bullet. And we're not going to crimp any today either. Just going to seat the bullet and call that done. The load for today is straight out of the Hornady manual. We're going to shoot accurate 1680, which is my favorite 300 blackout powder for function. You know, the, the new Hodgson CFE black is a similar sort of powder. Very gassy, maybe a touch dirty, not quite perfect, but it provides excellent function and will run just about any gun. So yeah, that's going to be our load for today is 19 grains of accurate 1680 with the 168 grain Hornady Amax. These guys, 168 grain Amax with a CCI number 41 primer. So just a very generic load that I would expect to shoot well. And we're gonna throw it into uh, you know brass that's sized with different dies. That's kind of the basics of it. Okay, let's have a quick look at our three dies. First up is the RCBS. This is a small base die, SB, small base and pretty standard. It does have a vent there at the neck. All three of these have got vents. So that helps a little bit with forming and crap, you know, uh, so you don't get lube dents and stuff. Very nicely made die. Very, very nicely made die out of RCBS. So that's our first option. Next is the Lee. This is a standard Lee sizing die. Nothing really special to see. Does have a vent hole. Pretty standard stuff. And same thing with our Forster. Vent hole, nicely made. All three of these dies are pretty nice. The RCBS and the Forster are a little more impressive in the fit and finish department, but overall, none of the three are bad. So let's pull them apart really quick and look at their different expanders. All right, first up is the Lee expander. It is just held in with a little collet. Guess I could take it out and show it to you. There we go. A little collet thingy that just squeezes it and holds it. It is a one piece design. And the lead, yeah, these lead decapping pins are very beefy. Like it, it's tough to break one of these guys. But if you do, you've got to replace the entire, the entire pin, which includes, you know, your expander ball. And that's what we're going to look at closer here in just a minute is the the expanders in the different dies and seeing if we can see any uh, dimension differences between them. So that's pretty straightforward. Not much going on there with the lead die. The RCBS die is a little bit different design. I need to zoom out a little bit, don't I? There we go. Yeah, maybe that'll be easier to see. Very simple you know, lock nut sort of set up here for adjustment. And then here, our expander will screw off and allow you to replace the decapping pin. There we go. So our little decapping pin is a replaceable part, slips inside of there and goes on to there. So that's RCBS and that's also pretty straightforward. The Forster is a lot like the RCBS, except for the fact that it's got this rubber O-ring sort of deal. And what you'll find is kind of the main part of the uh, this guy, it's not a tight fit. There's some slop there. So with this rubberized, yeah, this rubber O-ring sort of thing, And this thing, whenever it's tightened down, it allows the entire decapping assembly to, to move. Probably be easier to see whenever we're, you know, put back together. But it's allowed to wiggle and self-center itself. So I think the idea is that's supposed to lead to, uh, you know, a straighter neck, better concentricity and all of that sort of crap. This is also a replaceable decapping pin. 
there it is that guy just uh, slips in and out I didn't really need to take this all the way off and then the expander ball is actually threaded on and can be removed so just on you know the, the clever design side of the house I would have to give the uh, the nod to Forster I like the fact that that is able to float a little bit whether it actually helps anything or helps to uh, keep things straight especially when that neck is coming over the expander ball letting it kind of float and self-center that, that that makes sense to me so that's why I really like the uh, the Forster die and that's the one I have primarily used over the couple years that I've been uh, loading 300 blackout now what is very difficult is getting a consistent reading on the diameter of these guys that guy there, let's see there's a there's a 307 let's try another spot 3065 3065 3065 looks like 307 and 3065 are the numbers I'm seeing a lot yep which leads me to believe that 3065 is probably the closest to reality so let me write that guy down okay next is the RCBS 306 306 3065 306 3065 3065 yep looks like this guy is also going to be a 3065 and last is the Forster 3055 306 3055 3055 yeah, it looks like 3055 is going to be the number here with the Forster. Occasionally getting a 306, but most of the time it's wanting to say 3055. Interesting. So this is a fascinating result. So the die we've used the most, Forster assembly is two and a half thousandths below bullet diameter, and these guys. Lee and RCBS are one and a half thousandths below diameter. This is very, very interesting. So this would inherently have more neck tension, I think. A thousandth more, right? I don't think the size of this is exactly what you get. So like, let's say this is 3055 and our brass goes up in there. The neck gets formed and then it gets pulled over the expander ball to set that final diameter. There is some, they call it spring back, I think, where the final diameter is going to be smaller than the 3055 of our expander ball. All right, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm confusing myself and my brain is going 100 miles an hour and I'm trying to figure all of this out here in step one, but we don't need to. We've got our di diameters. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's form some brass. And maybe all of these numbers are going to make sense in the end. That's the hope, at least. All right, so this is prime real estate here on top of the turret, but I've got three spaces open here. Let's see, I want to go Lee, Forrester, RCBS. So let's put in the RCBS first. So RCBS, I don't know why they always make these. Uh, yeah, well, I'm sure they use this same decapping assembly for a bunch of different dies, but this thing being 11 feet long always kills me. Oh, and the, uh, the decapping pin on RCBS dies is about 40 feet long. So it normally really comes out the bottom a lot. Like if you're used to a normal die where that might seem sufficient, nope, that's not enough. Your expander ball is way the hell up in there. And the problem is if your expander ball is not below the neck portion of the die here, you can run into problems and crush cases. So if you're ever having cases where, you know, they're just getting crushed, that might be that there's not enough clearance between 
the part of the, the neck of the die and the expander ball, which should be just below it. So yeah, you get what I'm saying, right? There we go. For the RCBS die, that's about, that's about the right height. One thing I kind of like to watch is whenever I'm screwing it in, if you can watch the, uh, you know, the tip of your decapping pin and see whether it's wobbling or not, or a lot or not. Sometimes my redding dies, it seems like the decapping pins get bent or they were never straight to begin with and it's wobbling and stuff. And, but you can see here on the RCBS, it is very stable, very straight. The, the entire decapping assembly is pretty darn straight on this guy. So I'm gonna set up all these guys the same. Screw them down until they touch, and then go, let's see. Yeah, a quarter turn is too much. Yep, screw it down until it touches, and then go about an eighth of a turn beyond that. That's what I'm gonna go with. I want, I want to get the piece of brass fully up into the die. I want intimate contact between my shell holder and the, uh, and the bottom of the die at the top of the stroke. So here for this initial sizing, we want everything the die can give us, all right? There's the RCBS. Next up going in is the Forster. Now they have some pretty elaborate instructions about making sure that the vent hole, which I've got covered up somewhere. There it is. The vent hole is supposed to line up with the top third of the expander ball. Like about right there. And you know, you adjust the, the height of this dude. There we go. And then gauge it off of the height of the vent. So right now where I've got it is a little bit too high. I need to screw this guy out just a touch. There we go. That alignment looks a whole lot better. There's no way I can get it on camera, but you just eyeball it. Make sure that your vent hole is about in the top one third. And I think it's for the exact same reason I was just talking about on the RCBS about crushed cases and all of that sort of nonsense, getting that expander ball height correct can be important and it can be disastrous if you get it wrong. So there's the, uh, the Forster. That's about how much that guy sticks out. And this might be a good opportunity. I can show you how it, how it floats. And you look up here, maybe. And see it moving just a touch, maybe not. But yeah, I like that. I, li I dig that. Okay, setting this guy in the exact same way down until it touches and then a little bit more, less than a quarter turn, you know, same, same amount. Now the Lee wins the award for the hardest decapping assembly to get installed properly. Because like I said, this is just, it just slips through this. There we go. So it's just slipping through and you've got to get it tightened down while also setting your proper decapping pin height. What I generally end up doing is uh, eyeballing it until I know how much it needs to protrude here on the top. Mm, just to touch, yeah, that's about right, right there. So if you look up here at the top, just a little bit above flush. So now I'm going to watch that and hopefully it doesn't move while I get some tools. Where the hell did my, there it is. It's behind the camera. It's hiding from me. There we go. Now we tighten that guy down just a little bit. And now it's mostly secure. It's not quite tight. We'll finish tightening, tightening it in the press. All right, same installation instructions for that dude. And actually now that it's in the press and tight, now I can, now I can move that expander up just a touch. All right, there we go. Now I think I got the lead set properly. Now the advantage of the lead design is that since that decapping assembly is just in there and pinched with, you know, a, a collet, if it hits something like, you know, a bird and primer, which we don't really deal with in 300 blackout, or I don't know, a, a case that doesn't have a flash hole, every once in a while you'll run into that. Instead of breaking the, the decapping rod, it generally just pushes it upward. So if you ever see this guy growing on top, that means you need to uh, tighten it down a little bit. 
that does occasionally happen. So you know what? I think that pretty much covers it. Need to remark my dies with their with their color code. Some of it got wiped off. Like I said, these are actually like uniform size. I think they're like one point. There you go. It actually comes out to like 1.353. So 1.358 is our minimum size. After I form this, it, I, I, it should be about 1.365, I think. So let me grab a little bit of Reading Imperial Sizing Dye Wax. The next video where we're doing a bunch, I'll probably use lanolin lube. But for this guy, I want to use some Reading Imperial Sizing Dye Wax. And really, before I re, uh, reassembled the dies, I should have wiped, the, wiped each of the expander balls with a little bit of this. But I didn't, because I'm an idiot. All right, here we go. First one up into the die. Felt pretty good. And out comes our decapping pin. Right after I got done telling you that you need to make sure you get it tight, I did not get it tight enough. Awesome. All right, we're going to need a second crescent wrench now. It's getting serious. Okay, loosen that guy up a little bit. Hopefully the decapping rod will go right up through there without giving us any problems. Come on. All right, there's pretty much as tight as I can get it. Now let's see if we can get our decapping pin out. There, here we go. That's better, so I need to reset that die from scratch. Let's see if our case came out to the right length. Eh, about 1.360. Crap, I was hoping for a little bit longer than that. All right, our, our die is reinstalled and much tighter this time. Let's see if it gives us a little less problem. Yeah, forming this brass really doesn't take much effort, right? I mean, it's not a, not a difficult procedure at all. All right, there we go. This is the last one of the first Lee batch here. They all seem good. So it looks like I did get the uh, freaking length a little bit shorter than I would have liked, but that's okay. It's uh, it's between minimum and maximum, but it's it's all they're all like three five nine, three five eight. So they're right about trim length, which will work just fine. No problems there. Okay, the next die is our Forster. They'll just double check and you know, that they're definitely getting good contact with the shell holder. So our case is all the way up inside of the die. Yeah, see this guy's a little bit longer, 1.362. And now that I think about it, whenever I was trying to figure out what length I should trim my blanks to come out the right length, this is the die I was using. This is kind of, you know, this was my target was about 1.6, well, one point three uh, in the lower one point three sixes, you know, like this to one point three six five, something like that was really what I was hoping for. Out of all of them, but they'll all be fine. Okay, five pieces with the Forester, no problem at all. Moving on to the RCBS. Yeah, the first one into each die, I'm really kind of loading it up with some lube there just to make sure that expander ball gets a little bit on it. All right, while we're over here, we've got the die set up. I'm going to go ahead and resize my Gemtech brass as well. All right, all of our brass has been resized now. So let me wipe them off with a little bit of alcohol to get this lube off. And then we'll take some measurements, see if we can tell any difference between our different dies. So I've try been trying to use the tools I have at my disposal here to take as many critical measurements as I can. First of all, the overall length of the rounds. All of them, I've measured them all, they're all between 1.358 and 1.364. Now, what I've found is the Lee die resulted in the 
long in the, in the shortest brass. It did not stretch much. One, uh, most of them are right at 1.358. Now the next guy, the Forster die, gave us the longest brass. Here's a good example here. 1.3615. A lot of these guys are 361, 362, 363. So they are the long ones. The RCBS are somewhere in between. There, you know, 1360, we'll see some 1359s, some 13, yeah, there's a 1358. Yeah, so Forster stretched it the most, followed by RCBS, and then uh, the Lee die stretched the least. It was the same deal with the Gemtech brass. The next thing I did, so the, uh, the Hornady headspace gauge kit or whatever, it doesn't really have one of these that are specifically for 300 blackout, like I don't know what the uh, datum line measurement or whatever is, but the closest we've got is a 350. So I believe that hole is 0 0.350. It does stop on the neck of the 300 blackout, whether it's the proper place, I don't know, but it should be at least enough to index consistently off of to take some measurements. So I put it in my calipers, I zero my calipers right there, and then that's our measurement. This was a very surprising measurement. The Lee gives us a very consistent 1.078 inches. The Forster is 1.064, 14 thousandths shorter than the Lee die. The RCBS gives us 1.072, usually. These are a little bit fiddly. Yeah, 1.072, yeah, is what I was getting. The readings with the Gemtech brass were, were somewhat similar. Let's see, the next, no. The next I did, I tried to measure the inside of the neck, which is very difficult with a set of calipers, but I tried anyway. What I came up with was uh, 304 here in the, Go a little bit more shallow. Yeah, this is a very, very crappy measurement to take. It is very hard to get a consistent reading. But I tell you what, I tried it earlier. I was getting 304 on most of these. Yeah, I don't know. Let's just forget that one. Screw it. The expander ball size is the most important part. And that's what directly affects that next size. So. We, we have a better measurement with the expander ball. We know the Forster is a little bit smaller, which should mean a little bit tighter neck. This one earlier, I was getting some somewhat uh, repeatable readings where th these were giving me 303 and the others were giving me 304. So I think our Forster brass has got, yep, a little bit tighter neck there. The next thing I did was I measured neck thickness. Now I've actually got numbers for all of the different head stamps we're gonna use. Yeah, this is uh, pretty much impossible to read on camera. But the number I ended up getting was 10 and a half. So I'm getting about 10 and a half thousandths reading with the Lake City brass. Our Gemtech brass is about an 11, 11 thousandths. Thickness, yeah, that's right, right at 11 that you can't read. But I've been, yeah, looking at that neck thickness, 10 and a half for Lake City and 11 for Gemtech. The other measurement that I was able to get a nice uh, consistent reading on is right below the shoulder. Yeah, like right below where the shoulder is, getting 360 for the Lee, 358 here for the Forster, if I can find it, yeah, 358. And then the RCBS was also 358. Yep, perfect. And that number was the same with the two different uh, types of brass. So the Lees were 360, the RCBS and Forsters were 358. So that's pretty much it. That's what I've got for measurements here of the brass. It's pretty much ready to rock. I'm gonna hit this guy with a quick chamfer and deburr, and then we'll be ready for primers. Let's get these guys loaded up. All right, so I'm just using a hand primer here.
No problems here with the Lake City brass. We got the military crimps removed pretty well before I started the video, so they're going in nicely. I'm just going to throw these charges. I've got my uh, RCBS Uniflow powder measure set up to throw 19 grains, and Accurate 1680, it throws so accurately that it's not worth the time to weigh them out for a test like this. This should be a somewhat compressed charge. And I did that on purpose because, you know, I have had people comment and asking me where they load compressed charges and they find that uh, their rounds can grow even over time, just sitting in, uh, you know, sitting in a box. The compressed charge can, can push the bullet out. So I'm hoping in a similar vein, you know, if we got a nice little compressed charge, whenever we slam a bolt home or something, the powder will be putting a little bit of pressure on the bullet, maybe uh, make it more prone to jump if it's going to jump, you know, or grow if it's going to grow. So I need to, it's been a couple hours since I set up my powder measure. So I need like to run a couple charges through it. Make sure any settling that's happened doesn't give me uh, heavy charges to start out with. Make sure I get all the, all the powder out of that piece of brass. Good deal. Now I'll just throw them right here in the tray. Just to show you the powder fill, need a flashlight assist, I think. There it is right there, right at the base of the neck, right where the shoulder starts is where our powder level is. And this big 168 grain Amax is going to protrude down into the case quite a lot. All right, so our target overall length is 2.215. Get this guy dialed in. All right, I think I got her die close. 2.216. So yeah, kind of pretty close to that 2.215 number. So like I had mentioned earlier, we're not doing any crimp at all. So we're just seating the bullet and that's gonna be it. Tell you what, once we finish seating these, so this one, this next one is the Forster. I'm not really feeling any differences in the feel as far as seating goes. Right, we think that the neck here with the Forster brass might be a little bit tighter, but it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel bad. But this is a really nice boat tail bullet that's easy to seat anyway, so. Maybe if we were shooting flat base bullets, we would notice the difference. All right, so the one last measurement I wanted to take was basically just around the neck with the bullet seated. Yeah, like right about there. And I'm getting 330 for everything. Makes a lot of sense to me because, you know, that measurement there should be bullet diameter plus the neck wall thickness on each side. I mean, that's basically what you're measuring, so... The Gem Tech and the Lake City Brass were both, you know, 10 and a half to 11 thousandths of, of neck thickness. So if you take a bullet that's 308, let's see, what, what was our number? 330? You know, we take a 308 bullet and we've got a total of 330. So we've got 22 thousandths to account for. And we're doing that with about 11 thousandths of, wall, of uh, neck thickness on each side. So the math works, man. All right, here's the thing. We're just about out of daylight. This might be a, a somewhat dark shooting session, but I want to shoot them. Let's get out there. All right, well, that figures. I'm rushing. It's almost dark, and my camera decides to have a memory card malfunction. I have no idea how much of the previous segment was actually recorded.
All right, folks, it's freaking amateur hour over here. Had, had a memory card failure, and that's just all there is to it. Lost a bunch of footage. But we must press on, continue with our quest, despite the challenges. So the first thing I did when I got out there was I grabbed one round from each of our rows, our Lake City and our Gym Tech Brass. So I started with the Lake City Brass that was resi or that was formed with the Lee. I took an overall length measurement of it, and then I put it in a magazine, which that's another thing we need to talk about. I did finally get one of the 300 Blackout P mags, and it kind of made a big difference, made life a little easier. So we'll talk about that here in just a second. But so I got my one test round, put it in the magazine, put it in the gun, and uh, used the bolt release to slam it home. I then ejected it, took a measurement, and repeated the exact same thing. So one round from each row, I slammed the bolt home four times. And I have put the results into a chart format in which you will see that none of them were perfect. They all grew in overall length, every single one of them. But you'll see some very interesting patterns here on this chart. The worst of the worst was the Lake City brass that had been formed with the Lee die. You know, very top right hand corner there. And if we follow it back, so the first slam, it grew two, it, it grew two inches from the original. Second slam, that increased to five. Third slam, it increased to seven. And then finally, the last slam made it 11. Below it, you'll see the Gym Tech brass with the lead eye was the second worst. So our two worst results came from the lead die. Now the RCB and RCBS and Forster were pretty darn similar to one another. You'll see them grouped there with the Gemtech brass at five and six thousandths of jump. Both of them seem to grow a thousandth or two every time you slam the bolt, but it just wasn't quite as drastic as the Lee brass. And the best of the best down there at the bottom was the Lake City brass with the Forster and the RCBS die brass. After four slams, they had only grown two thousandth and two thousandths, and it seemed to be stable. Like those last two slams didn't result in any change. So the one that looks out of place here is the, is the top one, the Lake City brass with the Lee die. If this followed exactly what I would expect, that would be down below the Gym Tech Forster. You know, we kind of have a group of the Gym Tech and then the Lake City below it. But for some reason that Lake City Lee load just didn't, uh, just wanted to keep on growing. So these results are fascinating. And th like this video was supposed to go up already, but I'm, I'm taking my time with it. I was going to try to finish it up last night, but I decided, you know, let, let's sleep on it. Let's think this through. I've done a little bit more research as I've gone along about neck tension and I've learned a few things. So, you know, the, so if we go back to our expander ball sizes, I think early in the, earlier in the video, I called the RCBS a 0 0.30, uh, six, five, it's actually three, zero, six, zero. And even back there during that part of the video, you could see on the calipers three, zero, six, zero was really what I was getting the most. So I'm kind of revising that measurement because for one, I think it matches reality. I mean, I think the measurement is closer to 3.060 and it also matches these results. I think it, 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 uh, helps to make sense of things. So, you know, our, our Lee brass was the worst when it was, you know, when it came to, to growing overall length and that expander ball was the biggest. I think that's what's going on, right? I think that 0 0.3065 expander is just a little bit too big. Now, a little bit too big is a whole lot better than a little bit too small because we could pull out that expander and polish it up and, and try to reduce its diameter. And I think maybe towards the end of this series, maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll, we'll go all the way through this video and the next video or whatever, whatever it takes to get through all the brass with the dies the way they are right now. And then maybe we'll do another video of optimizing each die, you know, talking about what we saw from each die and doing what we can to get the bre the best brass out of it. And I think for the Lee, that's going to be trying to reduce the size of that expander just a touch to get a little bit tighter neck fit. So you might ask how, do, so, you know, what did the groups look like? How did this result on paper? You saw them earlier, but let's have a little bit closer look with using what we know now. And you'll see the two Lee groups, 1.37 up there on the top left and 1.80 on the bottom, on the bottom left. Those are the two biggest groups. The Forster and the RCBS were a good bit tighter. You know, they're between that one inch and 1.4 inch 
So, you know, the groups from our Forster and RCBS were just a little bit tighter. Now it was, it was getting dark and I was rushing a little bit and th these were shot pretty quickly, but I was still doing a halfway decent job. Our gun might heat it up a little bit, but as far as the hold, I was pretty close to what I could do when I'm really taking my time, but it was rushed just a touch. Just, you know, just throwing that out there. The velocities, I don't know if they're significant. I, I doubt it. Other than outstanding standard deviation all the way across the board, which is what we see out of Accurate 1680 and CFE Black and these sorts of uh, ball powders where we can get a nice little compressed charge. They really shoot consistent velocities. And it's surprising, even, you know, even though here we were, you know, our rounds were stretching as they were getting chambered. So if we can figure out that problem and get it to where the round is very consistent and not stretching at all. Maybe it'll tighten up even more. I'm sure the groups will. Uh, back to the velocity. So you'll notice the, the Forster does have the two lowest velocities of the six group, but they're so very close. I don't know whether that's significant or not. I think uh, as we move on with the testing and gather more data, maybe we'll be able to see whether it is significant. So the question I'm left with at this point, if we go, let's go back to the stretch chart. Is this good or bad? Because we kind of stacked the, the deck here against ourselves because we used a heavily compressed charge and we did not crimp at all. So with those two qualifiers, this may be outstanding. You know, maybe only getting two thousands of uh, stretch out of our Lake City and Forster and RCBS combinations. Maybe that's outstanding. Maybe just uh, a very light crimp. They'd stay at zero and we'd be in good shape. Maybe even the Lee, you know, that, that seem to be pretty bad about stretching with that uh, larger expander ball. Maybe just a touch of crimp and, I, and a good portion of this would go away. We're gonna have to find that out as we go along. So let's take our fired brass and go through a couple of our, uh, you know, our critical measurements that we took earlier and see how they compare. Okay, so our, all of our cases have now been fired in my gun. And as we take this measurement, we should expect to see the same value from all of them. Since this was a nice hot load, these should be very well uh, fire formed to my chamber. So the first and probably most important measurement here is with our uh, headspace gauge, our 350 headspace gauge. Let's put our, our yeah, up there, the numbers we got previously, 1.082. Let's grab another random. This one's actually a gem tech where the last one was a, was a Lake City. Fiddle, fiddle, fiddle. 1.083, 1.082. These are still dirty and there's, uh, you know, some gunk and stuff that might uh, throw off my measurements a little bit, but this is, yeah, it looks like 1.082 is kind of the average. Seeing one every once in a while that's uh smidgen shorter or longer, but I think it's mainly just from cases being dirty and maybe not sitting in here nicely, whatever. One, let's call it 1.082. So if we go back to our previous numbers, we can see that, okay, a, a piece of Lee brass, where previously we, we had a, a reading of 1.078, now it's 1.082, that shoulder, whenever it fire formed, blew forward four thousandths. That's not bad. But if we go over to the Forster, which was 1.064, that's eight, 18 thousandths that this shoulder blew forward during uh, fire form. That's a lot. So the Forster is bumping the shoulder back way too far. Whether that's a problem, eh, not really. I've been using this die a whole lot over the last year and I've found excellent brass life. So it may not be a huge deal like, like uh, something like that would be in a bottleneck case with a, with a larger shoulder but seems to be this, you know, this little shoulder is able to deal with getting set back too much. But like I mentioned, at the end of this series, maybe we'll just go, we'll go die by die and optimize its setting because, you know, we have control over that. All we have to do to reduce the amount that it's setting the shoulder back is just screw the die out a little bit. You know, we don't put the, the case so far up into the die. Now, if we could back out that Forster die enough to where maybe we're only bumping it down to you know 1.078 like the Lee or something like that. As long as it's still sizing the body of the case enough, that's fine. That's completely fine. So we'll be yeah we'll be checking that in the future. The next setting or the next uh, measurement I want to look at is that size right below the shoulder, 0.362, 
This is a lot easier when you're not reaching around a camera. All right, with the lead die, it seems to be like 365, 0.365, 364, something in that range. Over here to the Forster brass, 364, 364, and RCBS, 364. So they're all the same. We'll do a gem tech here just for the heck of it. 365-ish, 363, whatever, close enough. So if we look, once again, the Lee, which was a 360 straight out of the die, is getting blown out the least, right? Our tightest, well, actually, the Forster and the RCBS were both about 358. So they're just, uh, you know, the shoulder's getting expanded during fire forming a couple extra thousandths. So I think that's, that's pretty much the measurements that matter here. And it tells us that the Lee is just barely sizing enough for my gun. So the Lee die does have a history of people complaining about, you know, having function issues and not, and just their brass not getting sized quite enough. And this makes sense, right? If my, if my chamber was just a little bit tighter, either in headspace or diameter here, I could certainly have function issues. But luckily, the three barrels I've shot in so far, the lead eye does okay with. But I can see now why others might have issues. It's pretty close. So the RCBS seems to be the, the next smaller die. Shorter head space, shorter shoulder width, and then the RC, and then the Forster is the, uh, the shortest of all. Very short head space. So we're definitely learning. I'll tell you what, while we've got this uppy closey view here, let me show you this 300 Blackout magazine really quick. The differences are pretty subtle, but there's, there's two big ones that, that I noticed right off the bat. If you look at the ramp here, you know, the, the angled part right there, you can see that it, it, it ends right about at the little uh, oval that says uh, 556. If you look at the 300 black, the proper end of the 300 black, you'll see it's... Uh, it's steeper and it makes its way all the way down a little bit faster. There we go, there's some focus. Got a little bit too close. Yeah, you can see that it just uh, slopes a little bit faster there. The other one, I'll tell you what, let me pull the bottoms off these guys. This is a uh, M3 P mag. There we go, so it should be, you know, the same generation. Now here's the other big difference probably going to be difficult to get this guy to focus where I want it to focus. But you can see these ribs, right? Right there, that ride down the length of the magazine. There's the 300 Blackout, and this is the 556 magazine. You can see the 300 Blackout is a good bit smaller. It seems to be positioned roughly in the same spot. It's just a whole lot smaller and differently shaped. So now let me put them back together and I'll show you what that means. Actually, I should have probably given you this view of the, uh, the ramp stuff I was talking about. Where the 556 five, just extends a little bit farther. Here's a very good test case. This is the big old ugly 200 grain Maker Rex bullet. Monster ogive, just a big old hunk of uh, copper there. And in a traditional 5.56 magazine, when you slop it down in there, it goes in fine, but when you go much further, it hits that guy and the tip of the bullet is forced inward. So with the 223 mag, your rounds go in and then the noses start getting smushed inward, which is not cool, man. Not cool at all. There's a second, show you it does the same thing on the other. And that initial force that it takes to get over that little ramp kind of makes it a pain in the butt to uh to load rounds into a 556 magazine 
Now our 300 Blackout magazine, you'll see it goes down in there and now it can be pushed straight down and it never touches It never touches that little piece at all. See if I can actually get it to where it'll show it. It can't. Yep, so now they go in and slide right past that very easily. And it keeps them straight just like it's supposed to. And it just makes uh, popping rounds into these magazines 10 times easier than it used to be. I mean, it used to be a little bit of a pain in the butt and now it is not. Much smoother now. All right, so where does this leave us? Well, one thing I should mention, there were no function issues at all. I lost my video evidence, but you can trust me. These all fed just fine, ejected just like they should, and there were zero function issues. Now, I suspect in our next video that will not be the case. If we go back to the neck thickness chart that I had earlier, this gives you a preview of the other brass head stamps we're going to be forming and testing in the next video. And you can see that PPU has got a 13 thousandths thick neck. Wolf 223 has a 12 thousandths. I think those two are going to give us problems. And if they do, or when they do, I'll be fascinated to see if it happens with all of the dies or whether it only happens on some of them. So that, that's kind of, uh, that's what's coming next. And also, I'm not quite done with this brass. Especially like, you know, the Lake City, we formed it, we shot it, that's fine. But what about a resizing? You know, now that it's formed, does the same behavior continue after it's, uh, you know, resized again? So I think what we'll do is we'll move forward and do our additional, we've got like nine, nine more head stamps to test with today's procedure. Once we get through with that, we might run them all through a tumbler and then load them again with the same die just to uh, verify what we found in the initial forming loading. Yeah, and then after that, like I was saying, maybe we can talk about optimizing each die. So this is getting bigger and bigger. It's hilarious. I'm, I'm, you know, I've already edited a lot of this video and back in the beginning, like today was going to be the short video. We're just going to cover the test really quick and we'll be done. I mean, seriously, I started this video thinking it was going to be 20 minutes and it's probably going to be an hour. But I feel like we've covered a lot of ground and we've made some fascinating observations here with our first two pieces of brass. So I don't feel like we've wasted time. I'll tell you one thing I've learned through my uh, research as I'm doing this. There's only so much that neck tension can gain you or a smaller expander can gain you. So we know that our Forster has the smallest expander at 0 0.3055 and we know that our bullets are 0 0.308. So let's say I, t I just, I wanted more neck tension and I took this for the, the expander ball out of my Forster die and took it from 0 0.3055 all the way down to 0 0.304. So a full 4 thousandths below bullet diameter. Well, you reach a point where at, when you seat a bullet, if the neck's too small, it's simply gonna stretch out you know, the bullet is going to stretch it out and it won't result in any more effective neck tension than you would get with maybe say our Forster sizer now, which is 0 0.3055. So just reducing that expander ball size does not always necessarily just mean more neck tension. You reach a point of uh, diminishing returns, I guess. And what people talk about, a test that people talk about doing to test this is Let's say we had five different expanders and we sized them all with those different expanders and then we seeded a bullet into each of the five and then we pulled out the bullet from each of the five and then we measured the neck of each of the five. So we should see at some point where, you know, maybe a neck that wasn't sized quite enough is going to be larger and then one that's smaller, it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, but you'll reach a point to where it evens out and they're all the same size because inserting the bullet just spread them out that far and they were only, and they were only able to uh, retract a certain amount. For some reason, I just, I find this hard to put into words, you know, or find words to explain myself. So why is the Lake City 
better than the gym tech so far at resisting bullet movement? Is there some quality in the Lake City brass that makes it more elastic? Or maybe there's some quality in the gym tech that makes it uh, slicker? Lubricious? Is that a word? Is lubricious a word? I gotta look that up, stand by. Yes, lubricious is a word and it has an interesting second meaning. All right, but we're looking for smooth and slippery with oil or a similar substance. I don't know, whatever. I'm talking about inherent lubriciousness. Is the gem tech just naturally slicker and there's less friction to overcome between the case neck and the bullet? I don't know and I don't really know how to test it or I haven't thought up a way to test it yet. And maybe as we test, you know, all of these more examples of different brass, we'll see this phenomenon more and more, you know, maybe somewhere in this box is some ludicrous lubriciousness. And we'll find that this ludicrous lubriciousness is so slickery that even the Forster die results in brass where bullets just can't hang brother. You know, this is a big, it's a big uh, thing to ask out of a little bit of brass, right? That 300 blackout, these are big ass heavy bullets, you know, I, I, and that's another reason why I chose the 168 grain A max. And even though it's a little bit heavy for a supersonic, but I just wanted that mass, right? I wanted that, that mass slamming home to maybe illustrate this uh, problem more. I don't know if it's working or not, but we got results. So I think this is where we'll call it quits for video number one. Like I said, man, we're on a journey, we're on a quest. I cannot believe how long this video is, but I feel like it's good info. So I don't feel bad about it, I'm just surprised. So the next video, we've got nine more head stamps to test. I'm gonna need to think about it a little bit. I may need to split this into two videos just to reduce the uh, possibility of confusion as I go along and to maybe keep the uh, length of the video in check. I'm not sure, but all I know is we got something good started here. I think we're getting good feedback and we're on the verge of solving some problems, I think. So if you want to help support the channel, you know, help me buy some new freaking memory cards or something similar, come check me out at patreon.com slash reloading. I really appreciate all the support over there. And I will see you guys probably in a day or two. Yeah, I'm not sure. There probably won't be a video tomorrow, but something the next day. So I'll see you guys then.